Uh, and yeah, you can open us up with prayer if um, I don't know how too loud it is where you at. If you can, I don't know what you got going on. Hallelujah. Okay, maybe she's a little tied up. Uh, Angel, you can open us up with prayer if you like to. Sure, I can do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Abba, um, first and foremost, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together and read your word. We thank you for all that you've done for us today and every day. We thank you so much for keeping us safe and in your care, for providing all that you've provided for us, Abba. We thank you because we know that we do indeed um, dwell under the shadow of your wing and we know that you love us and that you're caring for us. And so we just thank you for that. Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding as we read and that you would show us and reveal to us things that we didn't know before. We pray that we would find wisdom in the words that we read and that we would be able to apply something from this reading to our lives. And if nothing else, we will have a deeper understanding of um, the infancy of Mashiach. Um, Father, I ask in the name of Yahusha that you would keep every person on this call and that you would supply everything that's needed according to your will. And um, I thank you and praise you again for today and for every blessing. I praise you for my brothers and sisters who are on this call. And I pray that, um, that we would give you glory and esteem and that we would reflect you. I ask all these things in the name of Yahusha. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Shalom, everyone. Shalom again. Hallelujah. And, you know, as we've been reading through this, um, I think one of the main takeaways that's really stood out to me so far has been it's just showing us this picture. It's painting this picture and giving us this story of the life of Mary, how well-known her family was, how well-known she was, um, how closely associated with the temple that her and her family were. Um, and I think it's helping us to see, uh, uh, or I guess, to get a better picture of how the relationship was when we see it in what we call the gospels when she's dealing with the Pharisees and the way they talking to her um, and the way they, you know, going about dealing with her, which really they being disrespectful to her, um, seeing that she had grew up closely with a lot of them. Um, I also see, I've also, something else I've kind of, uh, kind of just points I try to note of things that we see is the supernatural covering or the supernatural interaction that the Most High was having with her as he was really setting her apart amongst men for this purpose. Um, and we, now that we have some backstory on our family, we can see where, um, and we know the scripture says that Yah calls us from the foundations of the earth. Um, we were preordained. We actually see, we can actually see the preordaining of Mary where, um, the steps and it had all been laid already in such a way for her to be the vessel to bring into the world a Mashiach or our Messiah. So we ended last week with the angel Gabriel talking with her. Um, as we see that same story in Luke, it was just a little bit more in depth of a conversation. And it ended with almost like a side note, as it says, the angel then saluted her and left her presence. And then this is almost like a footnote, and it says, and it says, I, Yahushua, chose her myself according to my father's will, which is which is how he would say that, <laughs> and the counsel of the Ruach HaKodesh, of the Holy Spirit, 
and was formed out of her flesh by a means so mysterious that it defies the created reason. And I just had to read that again, because when you think of a virgin giving birth, even today, um, thousands of years later, we believe at least two, right? It's still a mystery of how a virgin could ever give birth. Um, and you know, ironically with the way the devil moves now i could see a situation with 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 um ivf and the way they can impregnate women to where i can see them one day impregnating scientifically a virgin and somehow some way trying to liken it to this um maybe that'll be the antichrist who knows maybe they did it already i don't know but you know just we know that Hasatan or the devil is good at trying to mimic Yah's creation. And that's the way I could see man trying to mimic, like, you know, as an ancient thought, just like Nimrod and them at the Tower of Babel, we see that we live in a world where man is always trying to find a way to mimic the Most High Yah or to make it seem like anything he can do, um, they can do. I didn't even know it was a TV show about that, Angel. That's crazy. But we see now that Mary's going to go and talk with um, Elizabeth. And I can't remember if Elizabeth was her cousin or her aunt or kinswoman, though. They were related. I guess I'll pick up the first reading here. It starts with Jerusalem, the highlands of Yehuda, and we know that Jerusalem sits on Mount Zion, at least part of it. Um, I'm not sure how it all is. I've never been. But it's it. Okay. So it starts with, so Mary finished up the purple and scarlet of which she was weaving, and we know that purple represents royalty. The scarlet can represent the blood, which makes sense because she is uh of the vessel that will bring royal blood into the world, um, true royal blood. I shouldn't say true because King David, you know, he was set apart as a king too, but the royal blood, I guess is the better way to say it. So Mary finished up the purple and the scarlet, and then she gave them to the priest who blessed her. See, at this time, the priest still blessing her, and we know that that's going to change <laughs> when, 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 when her son starts to claim he's the messiah and we're going to see here that started a lot earlier than just when he's grown and like the the perception towards her is going to change that, that's something else i've noticed from this as we've been going mary is a true example of a proverbs 31 righteous woman um the way she carries herself the way she speaks with people um the way she gives all glory to the most high all the time um and so on and so forth, as as you would expect that to be for the vessel chosen to bring um, the son of the most high into the world. But it said, and she then she gave them to the priest who blessed her, saying, the most high Yah has exalted your name, Miriam, and your praises will span the generations of the earth. Then Miriam rose up quickly in joy and left in haste to a faraway place to the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth, her kinswoman, who lived in a Judean town nestled in the hills. Now Miriam was amazed that Elizabeth could be expecting a child and so kept saying in her heart, how great and wonderful are your deeds, O almighty Elohim, for you have given children to an old woman who was barren. And knowing the story of her own birth, she definitely would understand, um, even without talking to her, the joy that Elizabeth would have um, to have had been barren and now be about to give birth to a child. I will not leave off walking until I have visited her and seen for myself the marvelous thing that Elohim has brought to pass in our days. A virgin who will bear a child and a barren woman who will give suck. She knocked at the door. She knocked at the door and called to her. And when Elizabeth heard 
Mary's cry, the baby leapt within her womb. Then Elizabeth, filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, cried aloud, Blessed are you above all women, and most holy is the fruit of your womb. And she put down her scarlet, and with great joy and gladness, raced to the door, flung it open, and as soon as she saw Mary there, she worshipped her and asked, How can it be that the mother of my master, or the mother of Adonai, should visit me? For behold, no sooner did the sound of your call enter into my ears, then did the child in my womb jump for joy and give you praise. And blessed indeed is she who believed for the things spoken to her by the Most High Yah will certainly be fulfilled. So now that speaks to um, Yahakanan, John the Baptist, right? As even before he was born, and we, we, we've seen that story, um, even before he was born, he um he um he's already filled with the spirit that's going to guide him to prepare the way, right? It says, then the devout and holy or Kodesh virgin embraced the true turtle dove, and the word baptized Yahakanah while yet in his mother's womb. That's interesting. Then Dawid appeared in their midst and proclaimed, mercy and truth have joined together and virtue and peace have kissed one another. Just then, Yahakanan stirred within the womb as if striving to come out and meet his master or meet Adonai, Hamashiach. And as they went into the house, Miriam and Elizabeth together said, my soul truly magnifies Yah and my spirit has delighted in Elohim my savior, for he has looked upon the lowliness of his servant. Behold, from this time forward, all generations will honor me because he that is all powerful has done marvelous things to me. And his name is holy or Kodesh set apart. His mercy is from generation to generation. Hallelujah, that's why we here. And is on those that fear him with his arm he has shown his might to disperse those whose hearts imagine proud things. He has pulled the rulers out of their thrones and replaced them with the oppressed. That's the day we wait on. And he's all he's done that in, in history, but this is the day we're waiting on. These so-called rulers and princes of this world that do the works of iniquity and darkness, Yah is going to replace them with the works of light. He has heaped good things upon the hungry, plundered the rich and banished them. He has brought deliverance to his servant, Yasharal, or Israel, that he might call to mind his forbearance, even as he swore to our ancestors, toward Ibrahim, or Abraham, and his children for all of eternity. And that's important because... This is like one of the main things, if not the main theme of this world we live in. Everybody's always trying to claim the covenant of Yah. But we know that when Yah made said covenant, he said that the covenant was to be eternal. It never changed. The only thing that changed really is the disposition of his people, what we do, how we move, how we handle our business, right? But after they had greeted each other, Miriam lost sight of the mysterious things that the Archangel Gabriel had revealed to her. And looking toward heaven, she groaned, Abba Yah, who am I that all the people of earth should venerate me? And that speaks to the humbleness and the humility that this story so far has painted of Miriam. Um, she was never one to be you know, she wasn't seeking the line, like she wasn't seeking the chief seats, as it says, as Hamashiach tells us, the Pharisees and all of those people who are going to go on. Even today, how so many of our people are in these religious positions and, and even within this awakening, how you have people who it's more about the chief seat and um, as what he say, being in the market and everybody know your name than doing what's right before Yah or 
representing as the as as, as my coach angel said when she was praying i think it was a good prayer reflecting yah you know we'll even even as we claim to do the work for things like that we see people do things where they may be saying yeah we the hebrews and we need to do this and that but is that a true reflection of what abba has called us to be i think that's going to be a very important question as we continue as 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 we continue to grow in um, the truth of Torah or the word of the Most High Yah. For three months until Miriam's time was near, she remained with Elizabeth and her womb grew with each day that passed. Miriam was 16 years old by the time that all of these astonishing things came about and she returned to her home for fear of the Israelites and he had, right? Because she's been betrothed to uh, Yosef. Um, and she was right to do this because we know that the Israelites immediately are going to start to um, accuse her of fornication um, slash adultery, if you want to say that, being that she was betrothed. But uh, and I think that's why to, to see this background of her upbringing in the temple around the folks and and how at a, she goes from being um, honored because of her righteousness, her humility, her humbleness to immediately being scorned um, um, and scorned based off of a lie that's going to spread about her. I think that's important. I, some of us go through that. Hallelujah. Anything, anybody want to, any questions, anything, comments, anything, anybody want to add about Miriam's visit with Elizabeth so far? I think it's interesting too that Abiyah says that Yahakanan was baptized in the womb. We know a lot of times scripture is kind of twisted to say we were born in the sin, which we were because we were born in the fleshly bodies. But um, it's just my thought. It's my opinion. But I like to I like to think that um, um, babies are just judged because they were or have sinned. Um, but I could be wrong. But it, it just, I think that's interesting that it says Yahak and I was baptized in the womb. Maybe we all were baptized in the womb. Hallelujah. I'm going to read the next part too. Anything anybody got? Okay. Well, just stop me as I go anyway. Y'all know how we roll. And shalom, shalom to everybody who done came in. I've seen a couple of you. The birth and naming of Yahakanah. Remember, Zachariah been told, you're going to name him Yahakanah. And he's, he's, if I'm not at this time, he can't even speak because he doubted in the temple. It says, now Elizabeth came to full term and brought forth a son. And there was great joy and gladness in her house, her family and her neighbors, hearing how the Most High Yah had shown her compassion rejoiced along with her because they knew she was barren. They knew she wanted to have children. So it was a joyous time to see her finally um, have a child. So on the eighth day, they came to circumcise him, intending to name him after his father, Zachariah. Not so, his mother insisted. His name is supposed to be John. And we know in Hebrew, John is Yahakonah. We know the Hebraic term for this word is, as we see, um, I always find that funny. They tell us the New Testament was in Greek, but whenever you bring the names up, the definitions is always, if you go to a strong concordance, it always say of Hebrew origin. Well, if it was written in Greeks about two white folks in Europe, then why is all these names in Hebrew? But <laughs> that's just me. But as we see, John's name would have been Yahakanah. And Yahakanah means Yahakanah, it means Yahuwah favored. And we know that he did favor John the Baptist. He was prepared from the womb to put, well, much longer than that, but he was prepared from the womb, set apart from the womb, as we're about to see, to prepare the way. And his mother, like, no, nah, his name is supposed to be Yahakanah. There is no one in your family with this name, they protested. 
That was probably a custom to name him after somebody who had came through the line. Elizabeth therefore said to them, ask his father what his name should be. Now, when Zechariah came out of the temple, they gestured to him, tell us what you have us name him. And he motioned for a tablet to write on and wrote out, his name is Jehoiakim. Remember, he can't even speak because he doubted. And none of them could believe these words. All of a sudden, just like the angel told him, he could open his mouth and his tongue was free to speak. Zechariah therefore praised Jah and urged them all to glorify him morning and evening. Everyone grew fearful and news of these things spread throughout the hills of Judea. Now, because the hand of Yahuwah was upon him, all who heard it took these things to heart and they asked. Now, because I know this is represented in the gospel. So just to paint this picture, I think it's been nine months. It was like right when she started, uh, became pregnant that his voice was taken. He works in the temple. So he's been doing a lot of right to talk with the other priests about going about doing the duties of the temple. Um, now at the at the uh, birth of his son, when he's naming him, he gets his tongue back. And the first thing he do is he prays Yah. You know, that makes me think of all of us as we come into the truth. And we all have a different story of when we realize that we were the descendants of the people of the Bible. And, um, you know, the truth about Hamashiach and the truth about the covenant and the laws and what we need to do. Um, and I think this is just a good example of what we may need to make sure we continue to do in all things is first praise Yah for everything that he's done for us. Um, praise him for the things we don't even understand. I, I like to think a lot of times when we pray and we thank the most high for blessings and different things, um, all the things that he's done that we don't even know he's done because he's made a crooked path straight. We don't even know some things that may lay ahead that the most high is protecting us from. They say, Zachariah, praise Yah. And this news spread throughout the hills of Judea, which is important. Everybody knew Zachariah, the priest, Elizabeth was barren, old age. They have a son. Zachariah couldn't speak until he spoke his name. Then he got his tongue back. Um, this news has spread through the hills of Judea. That's important because when you look at Yahakanan's life, John the Baptist, right? When we go through the Gospels, he's in the middle of the wilderness preaching. The Pharisees is coming out there. He really be scolding them. What y'all doing out here? Who told you to come get saved? Or not be saved, but who told you to come be baptized? Y'all up there doing this, doing that. So remember, even when Hamashiach asked him, they, I, I, I recall a scripture. They asked him a question and he said, I'll answer if you answer my question first. And his question was, was Jehoiakim sent from heaven? And it said the Pharisees knew that if they said yes, then he would ask them, then why don't y'all listen to him? Because he was telling them that he was the Messiah. The, you know, I ain't gonna lie. A lot of times when I read the Messiah, once again, I always tell y'all when I knew these was my people, I could hear this interaction. The Messiah was witty. He like, okay. So they knew he was asking them that because if you say, yeah, he from heaven, then why y'all don't listen when he tell y'all that I'm the Messiah? That's A. And B, it said that they said um, they couldn't say no because the people around viewed him as a prophet, right? And I just say all that to, so that we keep in this mind frame of this story. All of this plays into why John the Baptist or Yahakanan, the immerser, some would say, is viewed in this way. It says, now because the hand of Yahuwah was upon him, talk about Zechariah, all who heard it took these things to heart. And they asked, what is this child destined to become? And we know now he was destined to become, as Hamashiach himself said, the greatest prophet of all time. <laughs> he said, of all the prophets. Let me think, where is that? Somebody find that for me if you can, what Amashiach says. Of all the prophets, the greatest is John the Baptist. I believe he says it like that, but I could be wrong. It says, and filled with the Holy Spirit, his father Zechariah, mindful of the gift he had received from Elohim or the Most High, 
prophesy concerning his son, Yahakanan the Baptist. Mind you, Zechariah is a priest. So if he prophesying and being filled with the Ruach in the temple, um, people would be standing at attention, for lack of a better word. And his prophecy said, praise Yah, the Elohim of Yasharal, once again, putting putting some respect on the covenant. For he has come and freed his people, really, and lifted up a horn of salvation. For those of us of the house of his servant, Dawid, even as he has foretold in ancient times by the mouth of his holy prophets, deliverance from our enemies and from the grasp of those who hate us. Think, we've been reading Isaiah on the Shabbat. We've read Hoshiah. We've read Yoel, which is Joel. We've read Yonah, which is Jonah. We've read, I can't even remember, Micaiah, which is Micaiah. Um, we've read, we read a few prophets. And this is how they talking. Deliverance from our enemies. This is what Isaiah been on. We've been in chapter 40, 39, 38, really all of it, but deliverance from our enemies and from the grasp of those who hate us. Hate who? The church? No. Hate Islam? No. Hate uh, the Ashkenazi? No. He's saying those who hate us. Who? The Elohim of Israel. He freed his people. To be freed, that means you got to be in captivity. That means you got to be under servitude. Right? Hallelujah. Thank you for that scripture, Aki. To be free. And from the grasp of those who hate us, to show forbearance to our predecessors that he told, I'm going to go get them. He told Abraham in Genesis 15, your people are going to be in the land and they're going to be in, in servitude for 400 years. And then I'm going to recover them. They will have us believe that he was, that when Moses came, led by Yah to free Israel in Egypt, it was 400 years. But when you go through and you timeline it up where it talks about who was beget here and years here and deaths here. They were only in servitude in Egypt about 150 years, 200 at best. Before then, we lived good. Under When Joseph was alive and Jacob and Yehuda, Judah and Simeon and all of the boys, they had the best land, which was Goshen. All of the cattle, we were a rich people, which that don't matter, but Yah had blessed his people abundantly. They weren't nobody's slaves. I don't believe Ephraim and Manasseh were nobody's slave. And it was Joseph's kids. It was after them because it said a Pharaoh arose that didn't know Joseph. That means he wasn't born when Joseph was alive. And from that time, we get 40 years of Moses, 40 more years of Moses till he was 80. He come back at 80. We get him freeing, Yah using him to free Israel. And then we get 120 years of his life. So it doesn't timeline up. So once we can prove that, which we can prove that, um, that means we still have a 400-year prophecy given to Abraham that I'm going to save your people. Just so happened, a people that were stolen out of Africa, <laughs> boated to another land, have been in a land for 402 years, they say now, right? Um, I don't think we're just at 400. I think we're around 398, 399. But either way, we're, we're right here. And as he said here, Zechariah, as he's prophesying about Yahakanan the Baptist, he said to show forbearance to our predecessors, meaning Yah is going to pay for what he said to our predecessors. And he did tell Abraham that. And that ain't been fulfilled. And call to mind the holiness of the promise, the solemn pledge that he made to our father, Ibrahim to grant that we be saved. That's what he told him in Genesis 15 when he made the covenant with him. That we be saved from the clutches of our enemies and to serve him without fear. Hallelujah. In purity and virtue in his sight every day of our lives. When we serve Yah, we understand it. It ain't just about um, a lip service. We have to do it in purity and virtue. We have to do it in righteousness and truth, the scriptures say, but we have to do it in action and deed as well as speech. And that's what he's saying. Yes, child, and you will be known as the prophet of the most high. And we know this prophecy came true. That's exactly what Yah and I became. 
since you will go ahead of him to clear his way. We just read this in Isaiah chapter 40. To give knowledge for the deliverance of his people. And when we were just reading Isaiah chapter 40 on the Shabbat, we realized that Yah has prepared all of you to prepare his way. This is what we've been called for. We've been called to go ahead of him to clear the way, to give knowledge for the deliverance of his people. Is that not what we be doing? I, Daniel, when you and I was talking to your family, is this not what you be trying to do? <laughs> I know this is what you're trying to do. Well, my mm -hmm. DJ be talking to his mama. Is this, this what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. This is what we've been called to do. To prepare the way. To give knowledge for the deliverance of his people. In his pardoning of, our, of their sins. Are we not telling our people, look, we the people. Hamashiach on the way. We could be forgiven of our sins. Look at us. We using ourselves as examples. Like, look at where I done came to. I ain't did that on my own. I, you know why I can say that confidently, knowing that y'all done said that? Because that's the truth. That's part of our story. We telling somebody who done known us for 30, 40 years, 20 years. Like, you remember how I was when I met you? And they wondering, how can you like that now? And you like, because I realized who I was. I started taking serious the covenant. And the most high done pardoned me of my sins. Now, he ain't just pardoned me to be any old kind of way, right? That's the grace. Grace is he pardoned me for nothing I was doing because he was paying forbearance to my ancestor. And see, now I know that Abraham was my ancestor. See what I'm saying? But the extension of grace just gets me there. I have to learn to apply this to my life to stay in those good graces, for lack of a better word. But he has pardoned us. For tender is the mercy of our Elohim, which is why he will look up on us from above. Ain't that what he's doing now? When we be praying and we seeing prayers be answered, that's what he's doing now. We know in Proverbs it says, we know that in the Proverbs it says, Proverbs 28, I'll read this quite a bit. Proverbs 28 verse nine said, he that turned away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. And for the longest, we ain't heard the law. If we did, we didn't care to hear it. We didn't care to know it. It didn't, it didn't necessarily make a difference upon what was going on with us, right? But now that we've learned we are these people and this was a covenant and Hamashiach is really our brother, as the scriptures say, right? Now we realize that we are turning our ear back to hearing the law which means our prayers aren't an abomination no more, which means, which is why he will look up on us from above. As the dawn breaks forth, and even now the day is dawning to shine on those who live in darkness. We know darkness in scripture is confusion, who live under the lie, who live under the um, oppression of Babylon and mystery Babylon now in our case. This is what we saying. We trying to shine the light unto the world, which was the original purpose of Israel. You are to be a light unto the world, a nation set apart to me. If we did right from the time of Moses, we would have been in the way that we conducted our business as a nation, teaching this world how to get closer to God. And in the irony of this, this is why what some of these Israelites in this awakening do is so destructive and shameful. I shouldn't say destructive because Yah has a plan for it all. And he knew what was coming. But it is shameful because even today, as we are being called to prepare this way, like Yahakanan again, we are supposed to be shining this light. Even as, uh, in this small little, I don't want to say small, but in this awakening, that's, you know, it ain't all of our people, but the ones of us who own it, we are supposed to be shining this light on those who live in darkness, underneath the shadow of death, right? Because he told us, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you should fear no evil. You do walk through the valley of the shadow of death because the shadow of death is the lie. Now that can also be considered to be what we would call hell or Hades or Sheol, right? But it's also when you walk every day and we, in these nations, 
under these lies, these governments that lie, these doctrines that rule these nations be nations being lie, whether it be uh, religion or the Constitution. The Constitution is a lie. The Constitution starts out with every free man and blah, blah, blah. We know that when the Constitution was written, we were standing there and wasn't even free. The Constitution is a hypocritical doc document. We under the shadow of death, but we can shine this light. And hallelujah to those of you all here, because I know all of y'all every day is putting your best foot forward to shine the light. The light may, you may only have to shine the light on your household. Hallelujah. As the scriptures say, the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. It don't take much. Somebody on here may be called to shine the light on 10,000 somewhere. <laughs> Hallelujah. Keep stepping in the same manner. To guide our steps on the road to peace. This is what he's doing. I, re I, I mean that when I read that in my mind, I'm like, that's us today. We got the same calling as Yehachanah, the same one the disciples had. After Hamashiach died and the disciples were sent out, this was the same call, and they went to prepare the way. Make sure this word gets to the four corners on the earth. Paul took it to Rome. As James said, to the, to the 12 tribes of Israel spread abroad, this word is for you. As Peter said in, I think it's Acts chapter 7 or 13, he said, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham and all those who search after the Most High Yah, salvation is sent to you. And it's our job to go and teach that to Israel, but to anybody amongst Israel who want to learn it. At that time, Yahakanah was living in pros prosperity. And for two years, he nursed at the breast of his mother. The joy of Elohim was on his face. He grew up strengthened in the spirit. And I say hallelujah to that. Yahakanan had that calling on him his whole life. Remind me of these kids that we raising now in Torah from young ages, right? That's the prayer that they grow up strengthened in this same spirit that Yahakanan was given from the Most High Yah. Any questions, comments, anything anybody want to add about Yahakanan preparing? being called to prepare this way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, let's see how long is this? I think I'm going to keep reading. Yeah, I'm going to keep reading. Joseph discovers that Mary is pregnant or Miriam. Even as all of this was going on, Yosef, because he was a carpenter, was busily at work on a house building project near the seaside district in Capernaum. It's interesting. That's where he built the houses at because, you know, that's crazy because I wouldn't be surprised if some of them houses that the Messiah was going in in Capernaum was the houses that Yosef had built. Just knowing how on point the most high always is, but we'll see where he remained for nine months. So Yosef in Capernaum, he's been there for nine months. He don't know what's going on. <laughs> hey, yo, that's kind of crazy when you think about it. He come back home, Mary pregnant, Elizabeth that had a baby. Yo, remember Yosef, an elder, he was already like, I'm too old for all this. He probably came home and was like, yeah, it is crazy around here. <laughs> that's funny. But it said he was there for nine months. Think about how that changed. Think about how nine months being up there, he come home and it's like, man, you heard what's going on, right? Ain't no phone, ain't no, you know, ain't no Facebook, ain't no FaceTime, and he don't know. It says, now after the nine months had passed, as the customary engagement ceremonies were drawing to a close, three months after Mary's conception, so the nine months had passed as the customary engagement ceremonies were drawing to a close, and Mary's three months pregnant. That venerable man, Yosef, left the building site and returned to his hometown of Bethlehem, of Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. 
to get his house in order and to supply the provisions necessary for the wedding. He coming back to get everything together for him and Mary to be with, of which we seen. Yosef was already kind of like, Mary, you young, get you a young man. Y'all can raise children. I'm old. I got kids. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm widowed. But y'all was like, no, you exactly who she need to be with. Because even in marriage and it being done right, I don't need a young man who doesn't have children and want them, lusting after Mary. We don't need that. Y'all's like, nah. That's why he set her up with Yosef, who was already an elder. We don't need that. I think that's interesting too that he even had that, he even had that to the pinpoint um, detail. But Mary, the Most High's virgin, had returned to her parents' home in Galilee. Oh, because she was hiding. So now she didn't got pregnant. Yosef been gone. She went back home to her mama house to hide because her father, we know, passed away. That's interesting. I think it came up last time. Why didn't she go back to her mother's house? Along with the seven other virgins who were of the same age and period of waning. Remember, they, from the temple, they sent seven virgins with her um, for whatever reason to Yosef's house. And who had been appointed by the priests to care for her. Okay. And Yosef left Yehuda and traveled on to Galilee, planning to visit the virgin there. For it was by then nearly three months from their time of engagement. Behold, by the time Yosef entered into his home, Miriam was in her sixth month of pregnancy. Now she was betrothed, so it soon became clear to him that she was expecting, for she could not hide it from him. After all, he did have free access to her and did speak familiarly with her, so he naturally came to know. So he goes to her mother's house to see her. She's six months pregnant. Ain't no hiding at that point, most definitely. Um, that's why I say he had to come back after building his house for nine months. And he was like, yo, what done happened? <laughs> what are we going to see? When he realized that my virgin mother was pregnant, he was stunned and so entirely taken with distress that he started to shake. Now that makes sense because he knows how she's looked at in the temple. He he definitely is going to want to uplift her honor. So I could see this being a little distressing. Like, man, they're going to be playing me like I did some bogus with Mary. These people up here love her. That's probably what he's thinking. He slapped himself up on the face, dropped to the ground up on sackcloth and wailed. With what semblance, with what semblance am I to face the most high, my Elohim? What intercession am I able to offer on behalf of this young woman? And being that he know he ain't laid with her, he may be thinking, oh man, I done left her unattended up here building this house. And who knows what done happened, right? She was a virgin when I accepted her from Yah's temple but I have not protected her. Who has betrayed me? Who has carried out such wickedness, violating this virgin in my very own home? Could it be that my life has become like Adam's? For Adam was by himself in his time of prayer. When the serpent crept up and found Eve alone and beguiled her. You know what's so funny about that right there? I got to highlight that. <laughs> I got to highlight that. And the reason why I got to highlight that is because that's the first time. And one of you tell me if you know another time. Maybe I would miss something. But that's the first time in my five, six short years of reading the Bible that I heard an explanation on where Adam was at when the serpent walked up on Eve. I have always wondered that. Like, what is what was Adam doing? It's only y'all two. You've been told to name the animals. Where were you at when this serpent walked up on Eve? And now, and I've read this before. That's so funny that I read this before and that didn't even dawn on me. It said that Adam was by himself in his time of prayer. 
That makes sense. Not now, uh, you know, like I say, we read this. We're not trying to prove or disprove nothing. We just reading this to see if Abu Yah with his Ruach HaKodesh leads us to a better understanding and something that will inspire us to work harder at being closer to him. That's what this Tuesday is about. But I got to make a note of that because that actually makes sense to me that that's a plausible explanation for why she was in the garden by herself without Adam. Because I've always wondered that. It's only two of y'all, Adam. What was you out doing? But it says Adam was by himself in his time of prayer. When the serpent crept up and found Eve alone and beguiled her and think, Yosef thinking, dang, did they do me like that? I done went off nine months to build this house and the serpent done crept up. And a similar fate has befallen me. My Adonai, my Elohim, take my spirit for I would rather die than live. That's a truly honorable person that's like, I'd rather die than at the face trying to explain how Mary done ran off and got pregnant. I've been gone. And I have not protected this young woman. Remember, he's an elder. She's 16, right? And the virgins who had been with Miriam asked him, what are you saying, Master Yosef? We are quite convinced that no man has laid his hand on her. Ah, now just think. In the Gospels, I don't believe that it speaks of no virgins being with her. So she has, as an Israelite would know, by the mouths of two or three witnesses, it's truth established, right? She would have witnesses. If we if we just, you know, just on face with this story. I think that's interesting now the way they get to plan her like she ran off and was fornicating and doing this and doing that because these virgins would have been witnesses as they're telling Joseph or yourself. Now she ain't laid with no man. We know for sure that she has not sullied her innocence and that she has, in fact, preserved her virginity for Elohim himself has protected her. We have kept our eyes on her. And she continues ever with us in our prayers. Every day, an angel of Yah speaks with her. And every day she is fed by an angel's hand. How an evil could enter into her, or how there could be any sin within her, we do not know. But if you want us to tell you what we think it is, it is that nothing less than Elohim's angel has impregnated her, which even to say that is is uh because we know that the last time angels slept with women, it was giants and it was wickedness. So even if they said it just like that, definitely not meaning that, but even saying it like that to yourself was probably like, I don't know if that's no better. I almost rather it was a man. You <laughs> talking about an angel did it. Last time that happened, the earth had to be flooded. I don't know if that was comforting. Yourself was probably like, I'd rather it was a man than you say that. Are you trying to tell me that an angel of Elohim has gotten her pregnant? Yosef replied. Why are you trying to deceive me? Truly, it is more likely that someone disguised as an angel from Elohim has seduced her. That was been somebody crafty. And he sobbed as he spoke these things and asked, how am I going to look when I enter into Yah's temple? How am I to hide my circumstances from the priests of Yah? What am I supposed to do? And after he had spoken this, it occurred to him that he should run away and secretly put her away as well. Then Yosef got up from the sackcloth, summoned Miriam to himself and asked, why have you who were cared for by Elohim forgotten your Elohim and done this thing? Why have you who were hand fed by an angel and raised in the Holy of Holies gone and debased your very soul? Look, even he didn't believe at first. And through her tears, she sobbed, I am chast and have never slept with any man. As my Adonai is, as my master is the living Elohim. Yosef replied, I don't know why this has happened to me. And he could not even bring himself to eat or drink anything that day on account of his sorrow and dread. Yosef was messed up. And we know Yosef thinking, like, I told the priest I didn't want this. I did not want this young girl running around here with me. <laughs> and look at this, man. Now she here, pregnant. These folks would get to play me like I done done something. Ratchet. I didn't want this. 
Remember, when he had the staff and they was giving Miriam to him to be married, he hid his staff, didn't turn it in, didn't come to get it when the priest had came back with the staff. They was having to tell him, yo, Seth, what's up? Like, come. <laughs> he like, oh, my goodness, I knew. Now, once again, knowing my people, I can hear yourself. I knew I shouldn't have been up there doing none of that. I should have stuck to my first mind. Ain't that what we say? <laughs> and yourself left her there, unsure as to which course it would be best to take. He grew all the more anxious and confused the more he tried to figure out what he should do with her. For he was a righteous man and was not eager to expose her. That's honorable of yourself. He like, even though I messed up, mind you, he ain't slept with her. He knows, so he thinking at best somebody didn't crept in and slept with her. And he's still like, I can't do that to Mary. Mary, good people. That sounds like our people too. Nor as a pious man was he willing to stigmatize her with the reputation of a whore. If I should cover up her sin, he said, I will be opposing the law of Yah. And if I should expose her to the children of Yasharal, I fear that I might be handing over innocent blood to the sentence of death because adultery was a sentence of death for what is in her may indeed be from the angel. So he didn't have all doubt. He didn't have all doubt in his mind somewhere. He was like, man, it's possible though. He therefore determined firmly to terminate their engagement quietly and to divorce her and her secretly. And when he had decided this, he started to devise a scheme to hide Miriam and put her away. He planned to get up in the middle of the night, leave her there, and live in seclusion. But night fell upon him as he was working out the detail. Now behold, later on that evening, that holy prince of angels, the angel of Yahuwah's spirit, or Ruach, from the presence of Yah, as it describes Gabriel, came to this earth with an order from my father. So we see this is written from the standpoint of Hamashiach has written this himself, interestingly enough, and spoke to Yosef in his dreams, saying, Yosef, son of Dawid, do not be afraid. You know, interesting, I, I've seen many of Angel in dreams, but I've never spoken to one. Just as a side note, but I have seen at least what I believe to be angels in dreams before. Um, Do not fear to take this child, nor hesitate to take Mary as your wife. Do not think unseemly thoughts about the virgin, and do not imagine for a moment that she is guilty of fornication. For it is by the means of the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, that she has conceived and among all women is the only virgin who will ever give birth. And I just know for a fact with these sciences, if they have not, I could see them trying to put a baby in a virgin because that's the devil's way to say, that ain't true, we did it too. <laughs> Any odds on you? Hey, Shalom, uh, to your point, I seen this article that tried to say it's scientifically proven that women can get pregnant without a man if their body is in complete homeostasis and um if they have the right if they're if they eat the right way if their body's in complete homeostasis and if they sit in the sun or something to where the sunlight uh penetrates your skin to a perfect amount of degree they try to make it sound all fancy basically they're just saying bull crap they're just you know spitting out bull out their mouth in order order to and i can see the reason for them doing that is in order to disprove miriam it's in order to disprove the messiah it's in order to disprove um our our faith um so that they can um spew their garbage out in the air even more oh uh, true you know that's how the devil do you know it's coming you know it's coming they're gonna try i agree i i I've never heard that, but I'm sure they will try to do it in any type of way. It says that among all women is the only virgin who will ever give birth. And she will bring forth a son, even the very son of Elohim, whom you are to name. Y'all sure. The reason why we say y'all sure. This is a good time to break his name down because once again, 
just like everything in the, in the New Testament, when you bring up the name Jesus, as they have there, for, for supposedly a Greek document written to European Jews, I guess, it's another name of a Hebrew source. And this is sometimes people will hear me say Jesus is a translation of a translation. Because from the Hebrew, they first went to Isis, because I don't think there's any a J in the Latin language as well. And then they took it from this to what we call Jesus. But as we see, of Hebrew origin, that is Yahushua. This is why you all hear me say Yahushua. Some people say Yeshua. Some people say Yahweh Shah just based off the vowel points and how they decide to pronounce it. But it means Jehovah. But knowing now that there is no J in Hebrew, it means Yahuwah saved. Whom you are to name Yahushua is what he told him. And this is why we use this name for you know, because we use these names and, and, you know, just always wanting to explain. So anybody who hears this will understand. This is why we use these names, because we know that when this angel came in this dream to talk to Joseph, which I believe is 100 percent true. It happened just like this in real life. He ain't tell him his name was Jesus. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> he would have never because to an Israelite, that would have been like, who? Now he told him his name going to be Yahushua, which means Yahuwah saved, the Savior. For he will save his people from their sins. Think about that. It said, for he will save his people from their sins, which is what he said. Go to the sheep, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, all of these things came to pass in order to fulfill what Yah had spoken through the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bring forth a son whom they will call Emmanuel, which means Elohim in our midst when interpreted. And that's kind of one of the more famous prophecies. And that's Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. Isaiah was talking to King Ahaz at this time, who was a wicked king. And Ahaz said that he didn't want a sign. So Yah told him, look, tell dude, he wicked. He don't deserve a sign anyway. The sign going to be when a virgin give birth. He gave him a prophecy for thousands of years after, not even a thousand, I'm sorry, but about 700 years after him. <laughs> but that's where they came from. And you know what's even crazier now that I think about it? Because the prophecy that they're talking about comes from the book of Isaiah, right? And we see that, where is it? Isaiah's name, as we've been going through on Shabbat, is Yeshaya. I say Yeshayahu. I just like the Yahoo at the end of it, but it's Yeshaya, right? And it means Yah has saved also. <laughs> and that's what I mean about the most high being so precise with the details. He's telling yourself, you're going to name him Yahushua, which means Yahuwah salvation. He's telling them, it's a prophet who said, behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son whom they will call Emmanuel, which means Elohim in our midst when interpreted. And the prophet who said it, his name means Yah will save. <laughs> I tell you, the most high know he'd be on point. I think the reason why the most high be so on point on the details because some of this is so supernatural, so beyond us that he does it in a way that where we just like, wow, that's crazy. You know, um, it sticks out. I was saying, that's not like a coyote or something. He will rule all, as it says there. He will rule all nations with a rod of iron, which it also says in the book of Isaiah, I think chapter nine. And after saying all of this to him, the angel left his presence. And at midday, Yosef rose up from his slumber, gave praise to the Elohim of Yasharal. Now just think though, Yosef said when nightfall come, I'm gonna divorce her, leave her here. I'm gonna go sneak off somewhere and live in seclusion. 
He couldn't even get that part out. It's, he done fell asleep waiting for night, and Yada sent an angel to tell him before he wake up, don't do that like that. And when he woke up, he believed. <laughs> Because it said he gave praise to the Elohim of Israel. To the God of Israel. Uh, and like I tell you all, depending on who we talking to, God is okay, but be specific. We talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can be specific. Don't lose nobody getting too caught up in the Elohim and L-O-I. <laughs> Don't do that, man. It ain't worth it to lose them, man, getting caught up into that. Because we've been called to prepare the way. He gave praise to the God of Israel and thanked him who had shown him such mercy. He then shared his dream with Miriam, which had to be a load off her back because I'm sure she's standing around like, I don't know what this elder finna do. <laughs> and the other virgins who were there. And after receiving assurances from the angels and from Miriam, he confessed, I have sinned in my mistrust of you. And he did not divorce her, but kept her instead as the angel had instructed him. And she remained in there with him. Even so, he did not speak these things to anyone. Yeah, because he was still like, man, I don't know how this finna go. And it's got to come up. And we about to see it's finna come up. Anything, any questions, any comments, anything anybody want to add about um, uh, Yosef coming to find out that Miriam was pregnant? I just think this is interesting. It just flows. And it, it just, this this part of it is just helping us paint this picture of what's to come um, to help us better understand when we start the Gospels, why it's so much tension and strife around the son of our Elohim. Would anybody like to read the next chapter? Or at least do some reading. I think it's a long chapter, but I'll pick it up wherever they stop. <clears throat> Anybody want to do some reading? I will call you Ako Badaya. You always read. Somebody. There's some readers on here. Aye, aye. Obadiah, you still there? Uh -oh. Yes, I'm still here. You want to do some reading? Okay. Let's go. Tell me where you want me to start. Okay. Oh, yeah. A rumor started to get around that Mary was pregnant. So Annas, uh, the teacher of the law, came to Joseph and demanded, why have you not seen fit to join in our assembly? Joseph replied, because my travels tired me out and I took it easy on my first day back. Then, and it's uh, caught sight of Mary and saw for himself that she was with child. He, he ran to the priest and said, Joseph, for whom you have bore uh, witness has done a terrible thing uh, what is hold it? On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now think. First off, he like, why you ain't coming to join class and um come to the assembly, right? And then he go from that, he see that Mary pregnant, and he runs to tell the priest about yourself, just so we can paint this picture. Let's go. Uh, he ran to the priest and said, Joseph, for whom you have borne witness has done a terrible thing. What is it? Uh, the high priest asked him. He has deflowered the virgin whom he received from the Lord's temple. And as a reply, consummating his marriage to her without telling it to the children of Israel? Has Joseph really done this thing? The priest inquired, uh, send officers and you will find out that the virgin is pregnant. Some officers then uh, went and verified 
that it, it was true. Bringing Joseph and Mary back with them to the court, the temple officer seized Joseph and led him before the high priest who uh, began to accuse him together with the other priests uh, saying, how could you have been uh, cheated out of a wedding like this, a virgin whom uh, Elohim, own angel, nurtured as a dove in the temple, who never sought the company of any man, and whose understanding of Elohim, Elohim's law, was uh, on accident. So at first, because they think it, Yosef done done something, they blaming him. Man, she young. You knew that. You knew how we looked at her before we gave her to you. What are you up here doing? They kind of own Yosef about it. Um, you didn't deflowered her. You didn't tainted her. Um, and so on and so forth. But we're going to watch that change. But also, they know these angels used to come in here and feed her. She was always filled with the spirit of Yah. She know the Torah better than every other girl who was here, maybe even better than some of these men. Like, what have you done? Right here. Why have... Oh, hold on, hold on, Obadiah. We got a hand. And the eyes on you. Um, I noticed that how they, in the beginning, how they right here, they go after Joseph first. So they didn't even um really... You know, they're like feeling bad for her at this point. It sounds like a little bit as if they're feeling like, Joseph, why did you do this thing? She ain't nothing but just a girl. She's holy, this and that. So they're thinking that Joseph may have had to do something with um, kind of not for forcing it, but telling her like, it's OK, Mary, we can do this. You know, we're about to be married. So it's kind of like uh, they got that mindset of Joseph right now. Mm -hmm. the, the old man that seduced this young girl. <laughs> right, right. Plenty ball. You an old head, you that took advantage of this young girl and played on her emotions. Let's mm. go over the Why have you done this kind of thing? Had you not defiled this maiden, she would be a virgin today. But Joseph swore uh, an oath, on an oath that he had never even touched her, saying, as my uh, Lord is is the living Elohim, I am uh, to blame for the uh, state she's in. I am not to blame. I am not to blame for the state that she is in. Yeah. Do not, do not uh, prejudge yourself. Or perjure you. yourself. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, do not perjure yourself. The priest uh, rejoined, on up to the facts. Yeah, you have uh, failed to bow your head beneath the hand of power and have uh, consummated your marriage without telling it to the children of Israel and have thereby denied a blessing on your, your children. Joseph did not speak a word. So the priest demanded, restore the, excuse me, de, restore the virgin that you took from the Lord's temple. As Joseph wept in bitterness, the priest Hello. There you go. announced, I will give you both a drink of the water of uh, Yah's uh, testing, and it will witness to you of your sins. He then brought it over to Joseph to drink and sent him out into the hills and he returned to them unchanged. Interesting. They had some type of drink that they felt like would test you, but that's a whole nother story. Keep going. As Elohim is living, the high priest uh Albiatha yeah. uh, said to Joseph, I will therefore give you to drink the water of, of uh, 
Elohim, uh, the Almighty, test, testing, and he uh, will immediately show the signs of your sin. So Joseph also called uh, before the altar and given the uh, water of the uh, Elohim uh, testing out of which should anyone drink and walk walk around it several times, seven times, uh, will expose his guilt. For if he has spoken a falsehood, Elohim will show it in his face. Hmm. Joseph drank it gladly and went around the altar and did not uh, did not a trace of guilt appear on him. So the priests, the officers, and the people were ex exalted, uh, him saying, blessed are you for evil was not found in you. Now just think, now and yeah, we about to see a change from this old man that took advantage of this girl to what was you doing? <laughs> Then the great crowd of Israelites gathered around, and Mary was uh, ushered into uh, Yah's temple. The priests, her uh, neighbors, and even the parents uh, clamored to Mary, confess to the priests that you, who were first, were hand, were hand fed as a dove by angels in. Elohim's temple have committed sin and Mary and calling Mary to themselves they ask what excuse can you possibly give what sign will he give over and above the pregnancy that is clearly revealed in your own womb and the priest uh, demanded well I have you who were raised in the holies of holy, holies, uh, hand fed by angels, heard hymns and danced in his presence, done this humbling uh, your very soul and forgetting uh, uh, that Yah, your Elohim, since Joseph has been cleared with regard to you, we will only accept one answer from you. And that is that you should tell us who it was that seduced you. For truly, it'd be, it'd be better for you to confess than to have the wrath of Elohim revealed as a sign of your face, on your face, exposing you before us all. But Mary burst into tears and replied, As Yah is the living Elohim, I am un untainted before him and have never slept with any man. But he had Mary drink as well and venture, venture out into the hills, whereupon she also returned unchanged. Hallelujah. Mary. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. I can stop right there. That was mm -hmm. a lot of reading. Told I. I'll pick it up from here. We see this is some process that they had where you would drink something and go into the hills. It probably something that they said was anointed by Yah. We know that there was practices like this amongst Israel. Like it goes in line with the Urim and Thurim on the breastplate that in Samuel they would pray to and Yah would answer them from this breastplate or you know, we had some, we had different practices back then. Um, I think we would still know those things had our culture not been stolen from us, but I can't say I completely understand what they're doing here, but I just know it's something that they believe where Yah will reveal things to them. Um, but we say she did, did the same thing as Joseph and she came back unchanged. So then it says, Miriam then stood firmly and boldly proclaimed, if there is any evil or defilement in me, or if there has ever been in me any lust or lasciviousness, 
may Yahuwah expose me before everyone here that they might learn a lesson from my case. So we see Miriam is like, no, nah, you men up here trying to play me like I'm just some, you know, some uh, hussy or something. I just stood it strong. <laughs> You feel me? I just stood strong. We go we let Yah expose me then, which which is something we also see in Torah. There's been many times where somebody would say, Well, pray, let's pray and ask Yah to judge between us. That's in so many words, that's what she just did. And she approached the altar of Elohim in complete assurance, drank the water of testing, and went around it seven times. And not a trace of guilt was found in her. Seeing that she was pregnant, yet still displayed no sign of guilt, all of the people stammered. So now this was shocking. Um, because now it's like Joseph did it, she did it. What doesn't happen here? The fact that they keep saying, Well, angels fed you and you were in the Holy of Holies, they know she's been set apart in a way. But we know that, that even that's going to fly out the window when it comes to the testing of the priesthood and what they got going on. It's really because that's what Hamashiach did. He put the priesthood on blast and basically it was like, Y'all up here stealing from these people. <laughs> It says that the, the, the crowd stammered and were bewildered. But as is common in crowds, some of them became disorderly and complained to one another. Some of them blessed her, saying that she was Kodesh and pure, but others motivated by doubts denounced her, saying that she was wicked and defiled, which is our people. Some of us is like, nah, I don't know. She did the test. Everything looked good. But just like our people, it was a few of them in the crowd that was like, no, nah, Mary, you lying. <laughs> I don't know what kind of wickedness this is, but she didn't find a way to cheat that test. Ain't no way she pregnant and ain't, right? Knowing that Isaiah said, a virgin will bring forth. You got virgins with her from the temple that I'm sure are up there saying, ain't no man lay with her, but they don't want to hear that. They don't, right here, I, I ain't going to say it's the first time, but because we know that when Hamashiach comes, the priesthood breaks from Torah multiple times. In Leviticus, it said a priest would never rent his garments or tear his garments. When Hamashiach answered the priest at his trial, he rent his garments. Um, you aren't to bear false witness. They bear false witness against him in a multitude of things. So this is one of the earlier times, maybe the first in this story that we're going to see the people of Israel get away from Torah to make a decision based off how they feel about a situation. Because Torah says by two or three witnesses is truth established. And y'all know this prophecy that a virgin is supposed to give birth. So it ain't like this is just out the blue with Mary. There are certain things that they are really in the know of, of how certain things are supposed to go. Then Miriam, seeing how her integrity had not rid the people of their doubts, confidently said to them, as Elohim, Adonai of the multitudes, in whose sight I stand, lives. I have never slept with any man, nor has it ever crossed my mind, seeing that from the time of my youth until this day, I have been ever mindful of this vow. And I made this pledge, my offering to Elohim from early in my childhood, which the priest would know. Remember when he asked her to get married, she said, I already pledged my virginity to Yah for my life. So they know that, that I might dwell uprightly with him who made me live solely in him with whom I share my convictions and remain spotless and exclusively with him. Then the priest announced to them, if the Most High Yah has not revealed any sins in you, then neither will I judge you. So they, at this time, they like, okay, we gonna stand back and wait. And he let them both go. Then everyone started kissing her and asking her to forgive them for their vicious mistrust. Then Yosef and Miriam left for her for his house, joyfully praising the Elohim of Israel. See how Yah made their crooked path straight? Even with all that going on, Yah made sure that they were honored amongst these Israelites, no matter what they were saying. Everyone, including the priests and the virgins, led her home. Uh, Shalom, Mike and Ebony. I see your hand. Yo, Shalom. Oh. Yeah, when we was uh, reading about the uh, the test that they gave um, Yosef and uh, Mary, it reminded me of um, in Numbers where they uh, they did they did have a test that they uh, 
that they gave people to prove if um, if someone had committed adultery. It's in Numbers five, mm -hmm. uh, verse eleven down. Okay. And uh, yeah, if you they give you some type of bitter water, and um, and if you had like committed adultery, your your belly would swell up, and you really? can't. Yeah. Hallelujah! I, I was unaware of this. Numbers 5, 11 says, And Yah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharal, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither shake she be taken with the matter. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled, or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before Elohim. And the priest shall take holy water in the earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before Yah and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in, in his hand the bitter water that caused the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an, earth and, by an oath and say unto the woman, if no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another, Instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that caused the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of the husband, and if thou be defiled and some men have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, Yah make thee a curse and an oath among thy people. When the Most High do of make thy, 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 when the most I do of make your thigh rot and thy belly to swell. Hallelujah. Like I didn't even know that that was represented in Torah. So now we have understanding of what this process that Mary just went through and she was seeing okay. Yeah, a lot of stuff seemed like it's voodoo, but it's real, you know. No, you know what? That's a key point that you that you make because we do live in a world where just based off how things are presented now. If we saw somebody doing this in real time today, we would immediately be like, they into some type of food. <laughs> Most definitely. Anything else, Ah? Well, you know, the same thing is in the book of Tobit also, you know, the stuff you read in the book of Tobit, you'd be like, well, what is this? You know, so, hey, Stuff is real, and it's not really voodoo. It's just uh, it's just stuff that the Most High told us to do. This is something the Most High told Moses to do. So yeah, this is real, and it's not witchcraft. Hallelujah! That's a really good point. Thank you, Aki. And yeah, I see your hand, and then Obadiah. I was thinking the same thing, like as far as like. Even the um, even even doing the sacrifices like, uh, I know one of the offerings or sacrifices you have to like have one bird and and cut it and kill it and run the water under there sprinkling the blood on the other one like we would be like what the heck is going on like we wouldn't understand sure. that these are things commanded you know and um and you know so we we see that and then we immediately think like ah some some kind of cuckoo is going on here something crazy uh but it's because we have such a western mind and instead of an eastern mind from our homeland you know so we what they call evil is you know really good and then what they call good i mean what they call evil is actually good and what they call uh good is actually evil so yeah. You know, because they didn't understand it, they called it evil and wicked and 
and you know and distrust it and creating a distrust in our minds for if we see something like that so even like uh, half the time like we can open our mouths and some of, especially some of the women could open their mouths and say things to the most high and it'll cause things to happen and then they'll be like uh-uh she doing they doing voodoo they doing witchcraft you know what i'm saying because like i know that um uh, some of the slaves, you know, could open their mouths and, and that is why they didn't want to speak it in our language too. Cause we could say some powerful things in Hebrew and uh, call upon the covenant of the most high. And even though we're in the cursed state, it was still like, if we call upon that covenant, you know, you know, the most high don't, his word don't come back void. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna respond. You know, he said, you still ain't getting out of slavery <laughs> until the time is up. But uh, the most high, I, I do think that he step, came through and stepped forth because it wasn't us that said, let it be on our hands and on the hand, blood, that, that used blood. It was our forefathers, you know, that cursed us. And so I think that he still has some type of uh, mercy and, and lenience towards us, especially our ancestors um, in slavery. I, I still believe he has some type of leniency on them and um, where they were able to open their mouth and say a prayer or say something in Hebrew and the and they considered it witchcraft. So they had to beat the language out of them, you know? I could definitely see that. And, you know, the stories of the slaves, they told them if they were caught speaking their language, they were cutting slaves' tongues out too. And I know that you, I know that you believe, at least I believe you do, that it's power in the language. And that makes sense that um, Hasatan will be, or the devil will be using them to cut the tongues out of these slaves um, who was speaking this ancient language. That definitely makes sense. Hallelujah. Obadiah. Yes, uh, when uh, the brother uh, mentioned the word, uh, or he said the word uh, voodoo, immediately uh, that brought to mind uh, that the uh, Talmud uh, uh, worshiping uh, Jewish people even though they know uh, that we are the true uh, people of the book, uh, are reluctant to uh, step back because uh, one of them made the statement that uh, they don't want the uh, uh, faith to uh, go back into voodoo because they don't understand it they are reluctant to uh, uh, yield uh, back to uh, the original. They want to be <clears throat> in control of something. But uh, uh, I know in my heart that eventually uh, Yah would do something that will make them turn loose and prove that uh, we are the people and they're not. <clears throat> Agreed. I didn't know they made a statement like that, but that do sound like something they would say. That also is because they control media. So they understand that this awakening amongst these folks and not only just in America, they know that this awakening, this word of these people being these people is growing. So that sounds like a statement they would make to make it look like or they in the cult because we say that we did the sentence of these folks. Um, that type of terminology makes sense to me to try to discredit it before it get off the ground but i also agree with you that when yah is working that there is no that 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 can't work and we see now that what's going on in that country over there that they claiming to be theirs that ain't that they ain't got no time to focus on nothing because the world is it the, their world is closing in on them that they constructed you having these leaders in these nations that they run the banking system and governments questioning them right now like what are you doing so i see y'all using that as you don't even got time to be worried about what they doing you need to be worried about what's going on right here in front of you uh who had the hand up did you put your hand back up any y'all i did because i wanted to make a, a point to what uh, Ako Badaya said but before i forget what i was gonna say what you said <laughs> it's like all the stuff that's going on and y'all worried about the black African Americans right now. Like it's just, it's just, it's, it's funny to me that, that, that they're 
thinking that they're <laughs> well deep down they know that that their time is up and that we're waking up which I can see why they're making comments as like our problem is the African American community. It's just like, what's the big problem? Like, like if somebody was claiming to be me, right. And I'm like, no, they're not me. And I get to praying like father exposed them for they're not me. And they're pretending to be me. The father's going to, you know, come through and be like, look, he's going to show signs. He's going to show the people that, Hey, that person that's pretending to be on yah it's not on yah this is the real on yah right so what is, what are they so worried about let's quote unquote say we're not the people right and we're claiming to be them and trying to take over their stuff why don't y'all just pray and tell the father ask the father to reveal and and he will like you know that always i struck that as funny uh but to octo badaya's point when he was talking about that they had said something about um they don't want the faith going back in, into voodoo uh, first of all, they have something called the Kabbalah, which is literally Jewish magic. So, true. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> no, true. They are already in the voodoo. That's correct. Oh, those are really good points. That, and I seen that video with that woman saying that the biggest threat to us is the African Americans. And what I find ironic in that is they're calling the people that don't even got their own nation or nothing. <laughs> the biggest threat. I find that to be kind of funny, but it speaks to scriptures where Yah said, the sons of those who afflicted thee are going to come and worship at your feet. Hallelujah. After they uh, doing this back, it says, then the priest announced to them, if the most high Yah has not revealed any sins in you, then neither will I judge you. And he let them both go. Then everyone started kissing her and asking her to forgive them for their vicious mistrust. Then Yosef and Miriam left for his house, joyfully praising the Most High Yah, Elohim of Israel. Everyone, including the priests and the virgins, led her home, rejoicing, celebrating, and loudly proclaiming, Blessed be the name of Yah, who has revealed your holiness to Yasharal. And after this, Yosef married the virgin and guarded her. He ain't leave her alone no more. <laughs> hey, living separately alongside her for two months, never approaching her or lying with her, but keeping her as a perfect virgin as the angel had instructed him. So Yosef believed his angel and he ain't leave her no more. Now he married her still, but he ain't lay with her. And now he guarding her as he should, as he should. Any questions or comments, anything else anybody want to add from that chapter? Something else I find interesting right there is we see it now. They're like, okay, they're rejoicing and celebrating and all of that. But as we know, as this story go, when Amashiach comes and start revealing and doing these things, and once again, once he starts speaking about the Pharisees, how y'all really robbing these people and lying in the temple, y'all and selling blessings and doing all this and that, this is going to quickly change. But we see, and I don't think this is represented in the gospel, we see at first, they're celebrating Mary like, man, she passed the test of this drink that's in numbers as like Mike just showed us. We got to honor that. But there's going to come a time where they're going to break Torah because it doesn't fit with what they try to do. And they're not going to honor that. And y'all. Uh, what I was going to say to your point of Mashiach, when Mashiach was revealing, telling them like y'all over here selling blessings and stuff, it just reminded me of they still doing that to this day. To this day, I, um, <laughs> sure. they um, I seen the thing on TV and it was like, oh, you have ten thousand dollars worth of debt. Go ahead and show faith by sowing a ten thousand dollars seed, and yeah, and and God, look at this, and God will take care of your ten thousand dollar debt. So basically you're telling me I'm in $10,000 worth of debt and you want me to send you or put on my credit card $10,000 and then I'm going to be in debt for 20. Like, like y'all selling blessings. Like in order for y'all to bless people, like we got to pay y'all money, the church's money in order to get blessings from the most high, man. That's just wicked. Hallelujah. I was watching one of them old commercials with like um, Benny Hinn or one of them one day it was like late night on TV and he was they was showing her he was like um you know if you really like this message you could donate blah 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 to buy my book 
yada, yada, yada. It was big money too. It was like a hundred dollars. He was like, but if you want a little extra prayer and a little extra blessing pray for you, then you should donate a thousand dollars right now. And he has said something ridiculous, like, but if you want all of the prayer warriors here to focus on you and your family and to ensure that Yah or God blesses you and pray this, blah, 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 you should donate like 10,000 to the ministry right now. And I remember thinking like, blessings wasn't cheap back when they was out here preaching 10K. That's a lot of money to be sending you to pray for me. So you are correct. Um, you are correct. I have seen those same things. Hallelujah. Uh, I don't know if we got enough time to get to this next one. We about there. I guess we'll pick it up. Uh, we'll, we'll pick it up right here next time. Hallelujah. So now we're about to everybody coming. Um, would anybody like to take us out in prayer? The floor is yours. Anybody would like to. I, Patrick, I see your hand first and foremost. I'm still working up to praying us out. I'll get there. <laughs> but I had a question. Can you hear me all right? Sorry for the background noise. I hear you. I hear you. And it, it, maybe me and you can go over it another time because we're at the, the call button. Um, I'm sure we've gone over Israel and, and Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I've done some research and stuff. And uh, just because of everything that's going on over there, I didn't know if that, because I know there's some significance to it, especially since um, Yah's children are, are scattered, you know? And I don't know, I, I like I said, I think it's probably not a good time to bring it up, but um, I just know that the Hebrew, Hebrew part of the word isn't necessarily, um, I look at it as, as, as where Yah's children are. So, I mean, Israel could be anywhere. Am, am I saying that wrong? Or Israel, I should say. Does that make sense? No, wherever the people are is Israel. But we also, it, there also is a land that Yah set aside as Israel. And the word is here in the text is, is you hear me say Yasharal. Um, yeah. Some people say Yisrael. I'm just pronouncing it that way. But I say both, whatever comes out. <laughs> It means he will rule as Elohim, um, which makes sense, actually, because when you think about it, Israel was chosen to be the light of the world, to um, be a reflection, as the Yakoti prayed earlier, of Elohim. So when Israel is right, we should be displaying what the rule of Elohim looks like. So I, 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 I will break that down like that. So I appreciate it. Hallelujah. Anything else from anybody? Hallelujah. As we, as we, um, you know, as we just humble our hearts and our minds and focus on the throne room of Yah and the goodness of Yah for blessing us with another night. Um, we humbly come before the throne of Yah to say we thank you, Yah, for blessing us to um, go through your word and see what we can come up with once again. Um, we thank you for always leading us, Abba Yah, in all things and showing us the correct path forward. We thank you for blessing our households, Father Yah, and teaching us to prepare the way to be better servants in your temple um, and to allow your light to shine on our family on our friends and on anybody who you put us in front of. Uh, reiterate Nia Kulti from earlier that we are a true reflection of you. As we try to walk in the likeness and the image as you initially commanded at Adam, Abiyah, we just ask that you guide our steps and that you continue to um, make all of our crooked paths straight. I pray that your Ruach HaKodesh is over the reading in this conversation, that you bring forth what it is that we need to know, um, things to help us to be inspired and encouraged to be better, to grow closer to you, um, to walk this out as you have intended. I pray that you open Torah to all of us as we read it, Abiyah, to be um, our guiding light um, 
as we know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with Yah. We know that the word was made flesh. Um, we know that this is a living word. Um, and we know the same way Hamashiach is with us. Your Ruach HaKodesh is with us. We just ask that your word is with, uh, with us and written on our hearts to be better servants for your use as you see fit. I pray for everybody on the call that their families are secure, um, that we are healthy, that, that you continue to sustain us, Abiyah, um, that you pardon any iniquity that may still linger in our lives and that you fill our temples with your light to run off any darkness, Abiyah that you show us where we, where, we, where we make error in any way so that we can fulfill and be a part of this promise and this covenant that you have given to our ancestors that you have allowed us to relearn and understand. In the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, we pray all things. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Everybody have a wonderful evening. It's been real. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. shalom, shalom. shalom, shalom. shalom family. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom.